All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And what I was mentioning is that Caesars Entertainment is more than Caesars Palace. It's Harrah's, it's Spally's, it's uh, Paris. It is uh, Hera, excuse me, it is also 67 locations around the world. Uh, we're building in South Korea right now. Uh, Asia is a big gaming market and probably the largest gaming market. Anybody here who has been to Macau? Ever seen Macau? Okay. What did you think? Awesome. Awesome, right? Bigger than Las Vegas. No, I don't think so. No? <laughs> Seven times larger than Las Vegas. Seven times larger in revenue than Las Vegas. So, my previous life, uh, I worked for Las Vegas Sands Corporation, which is the dominant player in the Macau market. Uh, they make 90% of their EBITDA out of uh, Macau and Singapore. So Asia is very, very big. One of the things that I learned in Asia was that we had to build a high-performance technology platform, computing all the different needs and desires and wants and do it in real time with our customers on a mobile platform to make sure that we were interconnected in a proper way. And so when I was recruited away from uh, Sands to Caesars, uh, the idea was to do the same sort of thing. Now, my talk today is about high performance computing, absolutely, right? This is what we're here for. We're talking about a number of different things. Uh, but I have a business focus for you, the context of why we're doing this, what we need, and the specific things that are required. Because there are a lot of challenges in this field. There are a lot of challenges for us as a business. And then, of course, there are just the technical challenges. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is the business reasons, the drivers, the motivation, because that context, I think, is as important as any of the best products you could have possibly have or built. Now, I am not a suit guy. I look like I might be a suit guy, right? I'm your token suit guy for today, apparently. Um, but I've done a lot of startups, so you might know a couple of them. One was named Kayak, right? So I built that product, coded it myself in 2000, put together the uh, meta search engine, then licensed it up to some smart guys who left orbits and put it together and sold it to Priceline for $1.7 billion. Unfortunately, I was not on the front end of that money, so I'm here with you today. <laughs> um, the cool thing about being in startups is that it has a demand for innovation in a way that enterprise typically doesn't. Right? So you think about enterprise and you kind of get to start to yawn and you wonder why that was done and you slow your thinking down and you focus on hopefully not dying in your job. And the issue though with enterprise IT and technology and high performance computing is the demands of the marketplace are so great these days that you just cannot ignore the necessity of high performance computing or all the things that are driven with it. So, as I'm looking at this, and we're talking today, I will talk about also the technical challenges in this notion of a platform. So what do I mean? And this is a great context I like about my job, is I get to explain why you have to act more like a startup, and you have to understand high performance computing, and you need to understand and absorb trends better than your competitor in order to be effective. So I won't make this too academic, although it does come from uh, a, uh, a book, uh, a lot of the thinking, that was written by two MIT professors. Um, and oddly enough, I knew one of them when I was growing up. I grew up four doors down from him. But I haven't been in touch with him for 25 years. Turns out he's going to be probably nominated for a Nobel Prize in economics just for this specific theory of two-sided markets. And I would subject and suggest and recommend that you read this book, which is about platform strategies, called Platform Revolution, and that you put that context in your own thinking as you think about your technology and high-performance computing and everything that's going on today, the disruption of IoT, big data, analytics, everything. So on the left-hand side of this slide are companies who are pretty good at customer experience, because technology is not worth a darn unless it's going to turn into a transaction in some relation to the customer. And in my world, it has all about the customer. Caesars, if we don't get people to the gaming table, not good. If they don't buy our food and entertainment, not good. They've got to get to the hotel, which is very good, but if we don't do any of that, 
in a very high performance way with the type of analytics and capability and design that is necessary for these types of technologies. They're enabled by these technologies. We don't go anywhere. So on the far left hand side, a good experience is Starbucks. Everybody here drink Starbucks? Yeah, yeah, this is a jazz crowd, right? You were, uh, you were hoping for Starbucks this morning, but whatever we have back there is just as good. However, it's not as good because it didn't have a mobile app and allow you to figure out what you wanted before you got here and have it waiting for you with your name on it. And if you look at the public filings for Starbucks in the last two years, they spent more on technology and high performance computing than they did on their product, on tea or coffee. So I got to meet with their CEO who's now become their chairman in this private meeting we do up in Seattle. Super secret, we drink coffee. And we talk about stuff like the fact that Starbucks is really in the logistics business. It's not in the coffee business. I would submit that Caesars is not in the gaming business. It's in the customer experience business. And therefore, without the types of technologies that enable a great customer experience, we're not playing in the right field. We're not competitive. Now, move to the right-hand side here. Uber, Airbnb, Netflix. OK, we all know what Uber is, right? World's largest taxi company. Everybody would agree? They own any taxis? What do they own? A very high performance computing platform. What about Airbnb? Own any hotel rooms? Nope. Biggest hospitality company in the world. Netflix, largest cinema company in the world and not one theater. Facebook apparently can get people elected president. <laughs> they are a media company with no newspapers, no television stations, no radio stations. And regardless of your politics, you can think that they are pretty strong in their capability to influence the demand and the thinking of individuals on any topic. And then there's Caesars here, which is driving a very similar approach to a platform business. So moving from a brick and mortar pipe business to a platform business is core to where we need to be as a company to compete. We cannot be made into Kodak. We cannot be made into Xerox. We cannot be made into any number of companies that you want to look at that were in the Fortune 500 just 20 years ago and are no longer there or are no longer going to be able to sustain their business model unless they impose government regulation or licensing on their competitors which is not going to happen for much longer for any industry because there are too many economic dynamics at work to force that change, including the spread of gaming and gambling around the world from places like Macau to Japan to South Korea and to online. So we are in the business of a next generation platform that takes our customers to new levels of experience, things that are fun to do, things that are super great. And why? Because our customer looks like a mobile customer. They look like somebody who will wear connected devices. They are somebody who likes eSports. Everybody here play eSports? Anybody here play eSports? How about video gamers? Anybody gamers? Big time gamers? OK. What's your favorite game? Zelda. Zelda. <laughs> All right. What's your favorite game? Elder Scrolls. Elder Scrolls. Anybody play Call of Duty? Gears of War? Call of Duty, all right. Watch out for him at lunch. <laughs> um, Gears of War, anybody? All right. So, eSports 2020 will now be as revenue and profitability bigger than the NFL. But if you took video gaming, which is very interactive, very platform-based, very digital, it is about $2 billion less than the casino gaming integrated resort business as a form of entertainment. And that's the most profitable entertainment business in the world, is the one I'm in. And video gaming, all combined, is just about $2 billion behind us. So if you're a company like Caesars, you're thinking, wow, the marketplace is changing. I better be in touch with that type of customer. What kind of core technology do I need to make that happen in order to have an experience? And we talked about, or I heard in earlier presentations, excuse me, Internet of Things. Of course, it's growing by gazillions of, of, of nodes and, and points of presence and platforms that need to all be interconnected and do things in a very effective way. But they're also kind of uh, you know, scary, right? So we have a lot of threats at our company. Turns out people think we have money. Bad guys think we have money. 
They try to break in. When I was at Las Vegas Sands, we had a nation state try to break in. Um, and so we need performance platforms that can sort of calculate the risk posture that we have and the risk that we have for various attack vectors in a way that allows us to quickly react because, as we all know, the bad guys have to be right once. We have to be right all the time. Very hard to protect unless you understand the dynamics of your network, how it works, its pulse, its um, sort of baseline, and then the standard deviations outside that baseline of what performance looks like in your network. And so having compute in the cloud and doing it in a very effective way, absolutely essential. Unfortunately, this is what I got when I arrived at Caesars. This was my computing platform right here. It's not a trip through Delta's international uh, you know, flight path here. Okay. Point to point systems built on computing platforms from the 1970s and 1980s. Good thing about that from a cyber attack point of view is most of the people attacking you weren't born. They don't know what to do. They look at something and go, what is that? Better not attack it. I'll go after the Microsoft environment. All right. So, this historical architecture led to some big decisions uh, that I had to make to modernize the company's infrastructure. And essentially, um, while we were generating record numbers in our marketing and we're preserving our, our market share and our position, um, we could not sustain growth without moving to this, which is actually a combination of a variety of cloud platforms which we're putting in place right now, excuse me, putting in place right now. Um, I just did a presentation for some Wall Street analysts last week, uh, wore a different suit. I have two suits. Um, <laughs> and these are all orchestrated across our environment where we are able to now interconnect in a cloud environment uh, a sort of an orchestration of various services. But it's what is behind that that really drives effectiveness. So we're moving out a couple of uh, key systems this year. Um, I've been at the company six, almost 16 months, and we have deployed three major cloud systems. Um, we're deploying three more next year. And what is behind this is a need to enable this better customer engagement so through the innovation and the technology but specifically <clears throat> to drive more of our present activities, specifically our total rewards partnerships, our total rewards ad, uh, app, and our experience. And what we found is that by putting it in the cloud environment and moving to, for instance, on the customer management side, instead of a homegrown system to Salesforce, we were able to go to a million downloads of our total rewards app in a very short period of time. Now, that's not a really great number if you're a Silicon Valley startup, right? but it's pretty cool for an IT group and an enterprise organization. And then moving our experiences to other types of digital devices because, as I showed in that earlier slide, a lot of our customers like to be mobile and are definitely digital. But most specifically, we are moving to this model here. <clears throat> and the Salesforce announcement that came out last week with Mark Benioff on CNBC talking about how we're working together to build this platform, is a connected platform in real time for tailored offers that give each one of our customers either a channel to communicate back to us, whether it's email, social, mobile, a call center, one of our actual team members, or something off of our gaming or hospitality platform, and allow them to choose and configure their own experiences. And the core that's necessary here is a high performance computing platform. If we can't have the data analytics moving in real time and we can't connect our customers to our offers in real time, we can't achieve anything. But all the precursors, the steps there, is a cloud first strategy, is an environment where we can make those connections real time. And most IT enterprise suffers from the fact that they can't go from here to there. That means they can't get to that cloud environment. They can't convince the board of directors to do this and you can't convince your executive management to do that because they look at systems as purely assets as opposed to a strategy, as opposed to a business platform to outcompete everybody else in the industry. And that's fundamentally what my job has been at Caesars is to demonstrate that we can move to a computing platform that then becomes our business platform, much like Uber has a computing platform that's their business platform. 
and we now change the model of our business to have two sides to it, our consumers and then our providers on that single technology platform. So I would suggest to you that a high performance computing platform and everything else that goes with the discussions in the next days or previously has to do with getting to that business model. If you can't identify and articulate that within a business context as you work on your own jobs or within your own businesses or in a corporation, then you're missing the communication that is absolutely necessary to the justification for these sort of things. You can't get to better customer engagement, better experiences and machine learning because it's just going to sound too expensive or too ethereal or too out of context. The business term has to be there in order to make sure that the business is willing to accept it. So our journey as an organization, as a company, has been to move in that direction. And part of the way we've achieved that or have illustrated it inside the company has been to talk about the new experiences as much as the old experiences. So I asked about eSport earlier, and some of you may know that we're holding the Gears of War Tournament of Champions here June 2nd through the 5th over at Bally's and then behind in our studio. We have a film studio there, and it's a TV studio as well. And we're going to be broadcasting it through Twitch. Um, we're going to be, I believe, approximately 1,000 people on-prem for it. But we have about 3 million subscribers online already for the event. And we've done this a couple of times. Basically, um, we've been holding these eSport events. And the eSport events have illustrated all the points that I wanted to articulate to you here in this video. Which 16 gamers have converged upon the Paris Las Vegas Hotel and Casino for an unprecedented competition. Standing between these highly skilled players and $100,000 in prize money are five of the most popular mobile games on the Amazon App Store. Who will take home top prize and who will burn out? This is Champions of Fire. And this event, which was held in December of last year, uh, was followed on with a Gears of War Championship in Atlantic City, uh, and now this one coming up in June. But the reason we did this was to show that what are all the different elements of a technology platform do you need to engage this type of customer, which is our present and future customer. Somebody who likes gamification, who likes games, and for which we can see yield. And what we found on the yield on each one of these customers who came to us was about a 40% higher yield than our typical customer. So think about that. 40% higher profit yield on these customers than our other customers because we had an engagement platform that was connected to them in real time during the event. So while we had 500 members of the audience at this particular event and Amazon had sponsored it with us, um, we had 3 million people online watching it. And then we had a conversion rate at about 85% of everybody who attended and then everybody who subscribed to our TR rewards system, to our app. That meant that 85% of those people came to our properties and started gambling. So this is a way that we illustrated or thought of the use of this type of technology in a business setting. And we've been now applying it in other areas. <clears throat> Aside from real-time offers, we are setting up uh, an energy savings program with sensors, sort of an IoT project, uh, where we're finding 15 to 20% savings and our energy costs by using a high performance computing platform. And in this case, we're working with a company called C3 IoT, uh, and they've helped us out with two of our buildings. We're gonna be rolling this out across our, our network. Uh, we've also had great success with digital assistants or virtual concierge in a text and chatbot uh, with an 11% increase in our average daily rate as a result. That means more profitability from every one of our engagement models with our customer. And then we're now enabling these types of capabilities, which we didn't have before, which is the rapid rollout of smarter devices in the room, uh, better payment systems, uh, more unique uh, opportunities to engage the customer in either a food and beverage setting, or more importantly, artificial intelligence solutions. So the ability to really understand our business in an effective way. And finally, 
we're moving to a, and this may not be as easy to read from back in the room, but we're moving to a completely cloud environment for our infrastructure as much as we are for our compute. So we will have on-prem virtualized environments. Uh, we're looking to virtualize our entire gaming floor so that it becomes a private cloud on-prem, so we stay within regulation, and match that against our public cloud and private cloud off-prem, and in a way that is coherent with all our present computing needs on a wide area network or a, an area network that we manage based on the property or f physical location. So I did the rapid shoot 'em up sort of presentation, hit 10.15, which was my stop time. Uh, did, do, do we do Q&A or is that, is that part of it? Okay, so Q&A. My question is, did I bore you? Okay, good answers. You mentioned uh, artificial intelligence. You must be accumulating a lot of data about your customers. Are you using machine learning to figure out what you can learn from that? Absolutely. So we're using machine learning, uh, and these are sort of the public statements we make. Uh, we're using machine learning in our VIP group. So our VIP segment, we do machine learning con consistently, and we're seeing a significant yield from that. The data is collected through our transaction systems, through our VIP hosts, and then through our call center. So we aggregate three different, if you will, inputs, and in real time we turn around preferencing. Right now we're trying to turn those into intelligent bots that will then communicate back to the customer across all the various channels that I'd shown on that slide. Works really, really well, by the way, and that's why we're expanding it. It was based on Salesforce, and now we're expanding it to all of our customers. Um, so you, you commented on on the need to I want to say educate or say convince do an internal sales job on the business executives to help them understand that the uh, IT world or this enterprise um, computing resources they're not just stuff you have but they're actually able to to drive business for you um, could you comment on on some of the things that let's say worked well or some some obstacles that you got that you had that you think would be kind of generally applicable for people in other segments? I, great question. Um, because I, I think there are three elements to, to how this works. One is uh, sort of distilling or shifting the, un, the belief that IT or I technology are purely just assets that are operational. That they're back to the point you just made. They're drivers of the business. And it's articulating a business strategy as much as that business platform that is going to be supported by the technology. Then really drawing out what are the costs. In other words, what are the, what's the ROI, what's the IRR, and what's the net present value for every one of these investments and then as an aggregate. So it's a financial analysis that looks like a forecast or a P&L and a forecast. And then finally, it's demonstration. That's why the eSport events were so important because it wasn't just to talk about eSport, it was to talk about that characteristic of a customer which you must meet in today's market, which is mobile and digital and is self-determined and completely different from the person who plopped down 20 years ago at a slot machine and pulled the handle. Uh, because, by the way, that's not a millennial thing. We have people who are in their 60s and 70s who walk around with their mobile device and they're like, I don't want to go to a concierge. I want to figure out where to go. Why don't I have a wayfinder, right? Their screens are really big, but that's okay. Right? They, they're finding their way around our, our place. Other questions? Okay. I, I have one based on, on your current sort of slide. And, and I'm actually impressed with how much cloud and, and how you've taken the whole organization into cloud stuff. But I wonder um, how much sort of private cloud uh, you still have in the organization and how much public cloud and where you see that going if you're going to eventually go all public or there'll still be there'll, some more? Or there'll be private cloud on-prem for certain and some private cloud around sensitive information that uh, resides in somebody else's environment. Uh, I'm not in the data center business, and I'm, but uh, I'm very fond of the fact that the, the statement by the CEO of, of Infor, which is friends don't let friends build data centers. 
I think that's a smart one. And Switch is a great place to you know, have a cloud. That's why we're here. Uh, but we will maintain on-prem private, um, private in, and hybrid, if you will, uh, and public cloud where it makes sense. You, you, you wouldn't um, be willing to give us sort of a percentage of, of where you think it'll end up? You know, that's tough because you'd have to break it down by either revenue or by active users and, you know, traffic and data. And I don't really have a view on that at the moment. But, uh, you know, if it was two-thirds in the off-prem, that would make sense, and about a third on-prem. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention.